Well, let me say good evening to all my friends, or morning if you're catching the podcast in the morning time. It's good to be with you once again back here at the Big K's Corner, and we're going to be studying today and next week on the cost of rejecting God. Recently, when we were in our prayer time, and uh, we were going through our list of folks that we are praying that get saved, and, and I know you've got many on your list as well. Uh, the Lord began to burden me about something that I have heard often, but I really never sat down to take any uh, inventory as to how accurate it was. But um, there is a there is a dearth in the pulpits of our land today about preaching on the condemnation of sinners. Now, what we need to understand and what we need to comprehend, first of all, is that uh, God loves sinners. I want you to know that as we study the Word of God together for these next two sessions on the Big K's Corner podcast, I don't ever want you to get the slightest, the slightest hint whatsoever that myself, my pastor, my church, my church family, my wife, my children, none of us re- rejoice in the in the fact of the condemnation of sinners. But at the same time, John said it this way, the the wrath of God abideth on them already. Those that are without Christ, the only reason they're still breathing is because of the good mercies of God that are giving them an ample opportunity uh, to come to him. And so I begin to debate on the, the big two issues that go hand in hand with the idea of the lost and those that die without Christ. And the two issues are in regard to that of soul winning. There are those that believe in aggressive soul winning. I mean, really, really, really aggressive soul winning. And they've got a certain quota that they have disciplined themselves for and all the sorts that go with that about getting folk to make a prayer or a statement. And all the way to the opposite side of that extreme are those that believe that it's totally useless to even be a witness in public. Those that are going to come to Christ are going to come to Christ, and that's the end of it. Uh, You can tag that crowd. I've heard people as hyper-Calvinist and all that. Let me say just one thing on that. Uh, John Calvin didn't believe a lot of things he gets accused of believing. I'll promise you that. But nonetheless, the, the, there is there is those, those extremes, those that are what used to be back in the 80s when I was a young preacher. Uh, I used to hear the word screen door professions. I don't know if that's a very familiar term out there nowadays or not. And uh, there were almost, almost a push as to how many names you could get in the hat and that you mailed them in to your local church uh, brethren, so to say. And everyone had a big Sunday once a year, and it was the maximum attendance Sunday and the maximum professions in one service. And then there are those, I've heard it from from, from a, a, a friend of mine from his mouth to my ears one time tell me that he hadn't seen anyone saved in his church in over three years and uh, and was fine with that. That's that's the part that bothered me, was fine with it. So what does the Bible say? Well, here's what I want to do. I want to show you from the Word of God as we study together the fate that is the, the, the un, listen to me now, the unregenerate, those that have never trusted Christ, what does their future hold? And from studying the Word of God, let the Scripture move you and move myself into the, the, the amount of witnessing, the type of witnessing, the method of witnessing that you and I ought to do. All right, so we're going to study that, and then at the end of next week's podcast, we're going to dovetail right back where we started, and we're going to see if God will compile within us a prayer list and those that we know that need Christ, and you commit and I commit that we'll pray for those effectively, all right? Now, we're going to read from the book of the Revelation, chapter number 20, and uh, recently, uh, my pastor preached from this text, and uh, he put a he put a spin on it I didn't see coming, and it was uh, it was very enlightening. 
And uh, I just I enjoyed that message greatly. And so we took we took those those verses and went back through two or three, I believe it was two uh, old messages that we had preached from this text. And uh, we studied on those a while. And then I paralleled that study with uh, the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation. And I want to share with you what God gave me in those study times. Reading from Revelation chapter number 20. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 10. Well, I, I want to read verse number 10 simply because I long for this day. And then verse 11 will actually begin our, our text for the message in the study. The Bible said in Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 10, And the devil that deceived them, past tense, that deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I, that is John, I, John, saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, plural, according to their works." And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Several years ago, uh, probably... Uh, uh, going by my age now, it had been about 33 years ago. About 33 years ago, I became, uh, I became very inquisitive and uh, very uh, in, intrigued about the judgments of, of the Bible, in particular to the judgment seat of the believer at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, and the great white throne, the judgment we just read of the sinners, of those that died without Christ, died unsaved, that are called to reckoning on that day. Now, as I begin to study on this particular judgment, the judgment, the great white throne, there was a, there was a, a very, a very, very uh, serious question that I had. And uh, this question plagued me. I mean, it, it, really, it really done a work in my mind inquisitively. And, uh, and, and just as it happens, it does, this, this happens to me all the time, maybe to no one else, but uh, just as it happens, every good commentator that I was familiar with at that young age, which was limited, very limited, they all skipped my questions. I never understood why they do that. And uh, I've come to learn they don't know much more than me. And I look down in the footnotes, and the verse I'm looking for help on is not even listed. They don't even list the verse. They just skip right over it like a pogo stick. And I'm like, uh, Lord, help me, Jesus. But I've learned in those times that sometimes the Bible is silent. And if the Bible is silent, I've learned to be silent. Now, I, I used to not have that. I used to not have that discipline. I used to want to, if, if I couldn't figure it out, I'd put something together that sounded pretty good. And, uh, and that's not good. That's not good. And so uh, about five years, maybe 10 years, no, it was about five years later went by because I was pastoring. And I went back into this study, and it still, uh, there was a very, uh, uh, a very great interest in my heart. And this is what the question was. If a sinner is saved, or excuse me, a sinner is unsaved, and they have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and when they die, they go to hell, and we know that one day when the new heaven and the new earth is, is made, that uh, the hell will be somewhere else, it's, it's at least the, the hell that exists now, 
It will, it will change in form and it will change in title uh, to the lake of fire. But the, the hell that exists now versus the hell that will exist then is somewhat related to this great white throne. And here's what I've learned. I've learned that God's justice, okay, or you could say it this way, God's justness is so is so sovereign and omnipotent that he will let no sin go unpunished. None. Zero. So I will say it this way. What I learned is this. As a sinner dies today, and they, they'll lift their eyes in hell if they die lost, just as the rich man did many, many years ago, and they're going to a hell. That hell burns equally. It is the same temperature for Hitler as it is a person that maybe never done half as much or less. Uh, the, the good old boys that die without Jesus are burning in the equal amount of torment as the heinous murderers. And the reason that is, is because they've not yet made it to this great white throne. And I won't run a bunch of parallels, but I'll give you one statement that Luke made I found to be very, very uh, helpful in this. And this is what Luke said. Luke said, where much light is given, much light is required. Where many stripes are given, many stripes are required. And so, neighbor, uh, I don't understand this, and, and, and I don't expect everyone may, maybe that's listening to understand it. Maybe some of you can help me on it. But there will be a day when man will stand, lost mankind will stand at the great white throne judgment, and they will give an account for those books, the plural. And every single sin that they've ever done, whether it be in thought, motive, deed, action, whether it been whether it had been a, a, of some measurable magnitude in man's perspective, or in man's perspective something very mild and minor, uh, it matters not. It's been recorded. Now I cannot fathom for me. The amount of books, but then I get to thinking about the five loaves and two fishes, and if God can make a little bit go a long way, then I'm satisfied God can put a whole lot in a small book. All I know is if every single sin that's ever been committed by every unforgiven sinner from Adam to the last Mohican that ever lives Every deed is recorded. That's a lot of books. That, that's that's ima unimaginable. We can't even fathom that. But what I do know is this. There are three things that are in those books that I guarantee you every sinner will find. Number one, every sinner will see each time they rejected God's invitation to come unto Jesus. Now, I don't know how that's going to spell out or what it's going to read, but to say no to the gospel is a very heinous offense. As a matter of fact, that is the sin of unbelief. That is the sin that is listed in Revelation 21 and verse number 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving. And so uh, they're going to they're gonna see that. Number two, they're going to see every transgression. That is everything God said not to do, and they did. And everything God said to do, and they did not. Every one of them has been recorded. And thirdly, the amount of exposure they have had to the gospel. That's going to have a great impact because they're shunning the light that God has given them. Let me put it to you this way. You take a you take someone way down in in a, in a, in some third world country deep in the jungle back in the forest where there's never set foot a missionary in shoe leather and uh, that person is going to die saved or lost according to uh, Romans chapter number one, they're going to be with that excuse because the gospel hath appeared unto all men. And I believe that if God has to use an angel, he'll use an angel. But my point is 
That person's not been in, living in the light as someone that is raised in a Christian home or in a community with a fundamental church. I promise you one thing. If you die, if you die and go to hell out of the, out of the Piedmont of North Carolina, you've shunned a lot of light, friend, because God has flooded our area with um, with gospel witnesses and good preachers. Now, I know they're, you know, charlatans are a dime a dozen, but don't you think for one minute that we're void of the light. We're not a void of the preaching of the word. We're void of the hearing of the word. There's a huge difference. And we are gospel hardened. Our society is gospel hardened. Now, that's neither here nor yonder. So these books are open. Then the Bible very clearly says, that the Lamb's Book of Life is opened also. I believe it has been said countless numbers of times in my years and probably yours too. The easiest way to understand that is to show them that God is just and not letting them into heaven nor letting their sin be taken away because they received not the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that it's open simply to prove to them your name's not here. Now, I don't know if this is going to take a few minutes for each sinner. I don't know if it's going to take a thousand years for each sinner. It really doesn't matter. All I do know is this. When this judgment is over... They're going to hear depart from me, and they're going to hear it for the last and final time, and it's going to echo throughout eternity in their ears. Now, I want us to study just for a few min um, uh, minutes on the, the things that we are see seeing at this great white throne. This is the cause. Now, listen to me. This is, this is the cost of rejecting God. You can reject God in this life if you want to. But I promise you in the next life, you're going to see rejection from his side that there is no description, no, no description of how hard of a situation that is, all right? Okay, now no, I'm, I'm looking at this word great, okay? The Bible said, the, the sixth word, if I'm not mistaken, in verse 11, he said, I saw a great, a great white throne. Let me say that on that throne, there's a great sovereign. Now, whether this great is, is, is speaking of a measuring sense by way of size, it could be. I've, I've looked at that word several times from several different dictionaries and so forth. Uh, but basically, it, it's also great because of the authority that's on that. This throne trumps all other thrones. Every single throne that has ever existed in every kingdom and in any kingdom of any dialect, race, or nationality is far subordinate to this throne. This is the omnipotent throne. This is the throne of God Almighty. And it's a great throne. Not only is it a great throne because of the person that resides on it, the omnipotent one, but it's a great throne because as far as scripture is concerned, this is the final judgment that'll ever be held. There'll be no more judgments after this. Now, I know that somewhere, somehow, some way, in some way, I do not know how, the Bible, the Bible gives a, a brief glimpse into the subject that we'll judge angels. I'm not debating that with anyone because at this point in time, uh, Satan is done. He's finished. He's he's out of the way. He's he's already had his 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 time and his little season and all that. Listen, the the days of the fallen angels are over. I'm not worried about it. And if you want to fret over that, you can. Scripture says, as far as my Bible is concerned, from chapter 21 and chapter 22, there is no more judgment. The judgment is, is, is over. So this is probably, as far as Scripture gives us insight, 
the definitive last and final judgment. And it's a great judgment because there's no second guesses and there's no second chances. I want you to look at the great defeat in verse number 10. The Bible said, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. The first two occupants of that eternal lake of fire is the false prophet and the antichrist, the beast. And then when, uh, when, when the devil shows up, he'll be the third. Everyone at the great white throne makes up the remainder of those that are going to be in that horrible place. And I believe the fallen angels, the demons, what, whatever, uh, they're going to take up their boat there as well. Now, I want you to look at the great destruction In verse number 10, the Bible said, In the latter portion they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Let me draw your attention to that word tormented. Uh, This is not a torment that man can invent. There is no torment that man can make to equal what is going on in this lake of fire. Now, I'm not going to get into all the gross and gory things uh, that are are out there. Most of my podcast listening audience is very familiar with the torments of hell. But I promise you one thing, you don't want to be a part of it. You don't want to be a part of that. And if you're saved, you don't want your loved ones to be a part of that, okay? So that being said, there's a great defeat. There's a great destruction. In verse 11, there's a great deity. Verse number 11 said that him that sat on the throne, uh, his face, just his face, all of the earth fled. Now we know that's the lamb because that took place prior in in the uh, book of Revelation chapter 5 and chapter 6. We get a glimpse of the lamb, all right? So during this time, these people have fled at one time before. There's no one fleeing that day, okay? That death has given it up. Hell has given it up. The sea has given it up. All of those that are unsaved are standing before God. They're not running. So this fleeing took place before this day. That tells me that a whole lot of these people have had anywhere from the Old Testament a theophany, uh, an Old Testament appearance of Christ, or they have witnessed Christ in his miracles while he was upon the earth, or they witnessed the judgments in Revelation uh, chapter 6 through verse uh, chapter 19. Nonetheless, everyone knows that the person on that throne they have fled in fear from. Well, guess what? They don't run no more. Running days are over. When you're summoned to that throne, my friend, you're going. And there is nothing you can do to get out of it. You will not want to be there, but you will not escape it. If you die lost, you're going to be here on that fateful day. That being said, let's move along hurriedly. <clears throat> There's a great declaration. In verse number 12, the Bible says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. I saw the dead. This is the spiritually dead. This is the ones that are dead in sin and in trespasses. Now, I recognize that the grave and so forth, the sea, etc., has given up all of their occupants and the corpses have been resurrected and given some type of a body. I do not know what kind. It doesn't matter. But what I do know is, is that the dead has been declared as dead. There is no resuscitation. There is no regeneration. There is no quickening spirit to be done. Whereas the Holy Ghost had in days gone by tried to quicken them and get them to receive Christ. They rejected Christ and now they stand declared dead. That word dead has a summons of a sentence to it. You're dead and you're dead forever. You'll never know the gift of eternal life if you make your appearance at that throne. It's not going to happen. Now, I'm going to show you that very clearly, more so in next week's podcast. So be ready for it, all right? We see a great declaration. The dead that are standing there that day are judged for their sins. In verse number 12, the latter portion 
according to their works. You're not blaming sin on no one else. It's not because you had a bad childhood. It's not because someone did you wrong. It's not because you had some sort of a a mishap in life. Listen, beloved, there are going to be people there that, that, that were amputees. There are going to be people there that are blind and deaf. And folks that you and I would have great pity for, on that day, no pity. None whatsoever. It does not matter the misfortunes you had in this life. No misfortune was what worthy of you rejecting Christ. You're not getting into heaven because you were a, a, a handicapped by some part of your life down here. That's a game that's been played. Listen, do you know how many nations, even our beloved Israel, how many nations believe that if you die for the flag in the country that you, you've kind of got a you've got a, a, a entrance into heaven, so to say? Listen, you're not going to heaven as a patriot. You're going to heaven as a born again Christian, or you're not going. And those beloved Jews that God loves with all of His heart, they'll be standing there that day. If they died without Christ, they're going to be standing there that day. And the sad part is. Knowing that this is on the tail end of all that they went through in the tribulation. Sad indeed. <clears throat> As we close, I want to bring our thoughts to verse number 14 and 15. There was a great death. It was a great death in verse number 14. The Bible said, "In death and hell gave up the dead that were in them and were cast into the lake of fire. This is the singular Second death. This is the second death. There's not going to be a, a third death. The second death is the final death. Now, beloved, in the book of Revelation, in chapter number 22, the Bible says in verse number 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and come now, and let him that is a thirst come. Come right now. Right now. Don't put it all. Don't put it all. Because that is God's final altar call. We're going to go a little bit further into this next week, and I want you to be here. Pray that God give you a fresh burden for your lost loved ones as well as me. I don't want any of our people to be at that great white throne. Until next week, this is Brother Wilson, and that's all, folks.